Was this the ruling you expected? Um, it was the ruling ex I expected. By the way, a point of correction, that is not what the court held today. Um, not never. But what the court held is that Congress has to enact enabling legislation in order for this provision to take some effect. So point of correction. In any case, um, uh, yes, I expected this, to, uh, this ruling. Um, the only thing that surprised me was that, was that it was 9-0 as opposed to like 7-2 or 8-1. This was a long shot challenge from the start. If you sort of familiarize yourself with the case from the very beginning, when a bunch of law professors got on board, it was a very dubious set of arguments with real sort of long shot elements to it. Um, and I was not terribly surprised that it got shot down. Well, I was not terribly surprised that Donald Trump did an interview today and mischaracterized the whole thing. I want to share a little bit of it. It was a radio interview. Listen. I was very honored by a nine to nothing vote. And this is for future presidents. This is not for me. This is for future presidents, all presidents. The court did not say that. The court did not say that he was not an insurrectionist. What's your takeaway from the ruling? Well, first, I think that the court really wanted to take this issue off the table for the 2024 election. And I do think that that held across all nine justices. The court was unanimous in saying a state can't go it alone. A state can't simply decide we are going to unilaterally remove this person from the ballot. However, the court split so very sharply on the question of how exactly this section of the 14th Amendment, a crucial section enacted in the wake of the Civil War, to prevent insurrectionists from holding office can be enforced. And five justices, five conservatives, reached out and grabbed this issue that really was not necessary to decide the case, saying that only Congress can enforce this section through enabling legislation. Does anyone seriously think that Congress is going to do that so long as it remains divided? There were four other justices, the three liberals and Barrett, who dissented from that, the three liberals more sharply than Barrett. But I think it really doesn't sound quite right to say that this was unanimous when the court was so fractured over why exactly Trump should remain on the ballot and how far into the future this ruling should stretch when it comes to shielding or not shielding other insurrectionists. Then go deeper. Take us inside the court, because while it was a unanimous decision, liberals had their criticisms. Amy Coney Barrett came out and said, you know, we need to be united here. We need to take down the temperature. What's going on? Well, you know, the three liberals separate opinion was actually a styled as a concurrence. But I looked at the metadata in the decision and it was originally styled as a dissent. In fact, there's more. That opinion, while first say, uh, stated to be a joint author by the all, all three liberal justices, it was actually originally authored by Justice Sonia Sotomayor by herself. At some point in the process, the other two liberals joined and decided to make it a show of force and agreement among the three liberals. They are mad. They are upset about this decision. They use some very stormy rhetoric that I think is a trademark of Justice Sotomayor, but that Kagan and Jackson signed on to, to say, we really resent the court reaching this far. And Justice Barrett, even though she ultimately actually felt that the majority went too far as well, she scolded the three liberal justices, telling them, you know, I agree that this went too far, but we need to turn the national temperature down. We should not be in this election season saying anything that sounds strident or political. Oof. What does the justice's action today tell you in terms of clues of how they might hand this, handle this immunity claim? Well, look, I mean, I think the, the, there was already a lot of anxiety about how they are handling this immunity claim and you how think? they may be handling the immunity claim. I have that anxiety myself, right? The, the way that they've handled it so far, it's taken too long. It is taking too long. And they're putting at serious risk the prospect of a trial in the January 6th case before the fall. Some people think that's already off the table. I think there's still a little bit of hope, but that, that's the best you could say at this point, thanks to the justices. Suzanne, first of all, I love your house so much. Every single time you join <laughs> us from home, I want to do the whole show from there. Um, can we just break this down? Because the idea that the former president and current Republican frontrunners Longtime CFO, right? Alan Weisselberger. Alan Weisselberg has been with the Trump family for decades. This man is about to go to jail for the second time for lying on behalf of Donald Trump. This should be a monster story, yet it's like page three. How exactly did we get here again? Right. It's incredible. This is his second trip to Rikers Island for a sentence of what's looking like to be five months. And th this one started during the civil trial, the one that Donald Trump is facing that huge multi-million dollar penalty that he's going to have to put up a bond for shortly. 
And in the middle of the trial, Alan Weisselberg got on the stand and he was talking about his role in various aspects of valuations. And he said during that that he really had no role in valuing Donald Trump's triplex, the famous apartment that Donald Trump lives in, that he's claimed was 30,000 square feet. It's really 10,000 square feet. But Alan Weisberg really distanced himself from the valuation. And almost immediately afterward, Dan Alexander, who's a reporter at Forbes, put a story up that had huge documentation showing Alan Weiselberg was all over the valuation when it came to dealing with Forbes on that. Of course, Forbes puts out the list that names the top billionaires, and Donald Trump always wants to be on it. And Alan Weiselberg is always at the front of those conversations. And even the headline of the story that Dan Alexander wrote said, Alan Weiselberg lied on the stand, you know, and heads were spinning. And almost as quickly, Alan Weiselberg was facing perjury charges, which got him into court this morning and now has him on another round trip ticket to Rikers. Lied on the stand on behalf of Donald Trump. It's like Alan Weiselberg could have his own hush money case. He's the one who continues to get paid to misrepresent Donald Trump and his businesses. Can you remind our audience of how close this man is to Trump and his family. What an integral part he has been in the Trump organization, which is a tiny business, and he's been a key member. No, it's incredible. And I'm, I'm currently writing a book on Donald Trump and his money, and in doing that, we're going back and looking back to Fred Trump, Donald Trump's father. And Alan Weiselberg has been in the frame for 50 years. He was Five an zero. advisor. Five zero. He was a, an advisor to Fred Trump, and he got hired by Donald Trump um, in the 70s. He has been there every step of the way, and he knows where every penny is in that organization. He's crucial, and he's now in the middle of another trial coming up, the criminal trial that's coming up, the hush money payment trial. I don't expect him to be a witness in that. I think he, he w- was uncooperative in terms of you know, what he was willing to say that he knew. And I think that part of what happened today was that, the, you know, the, the now return trip to Rikers Island will discredit him as a witness. I think it both does that and it sends a message to any other witness that gets up that if you lie on the stand, this is what's going to happen. But he has been at the center of the Trump family since Donald Trump was in, you know, was, was very young. He has been at you know, the Trump org writ large for 50 some years. Sure has. Ankush, Donald Trump is also trying to fight this gag order that Alvin Bragg is trying to put in place in this hush money case. He's saying it's an infringement on his freedom of speech, his past social media posts and statements shouldn't matter. Think the judge is going to buy it? I doubt it. Right. Now, now Trump has done this a couple times already. He had, he's been under a gag order in the civil fraud trial in Manhattan. He's under a gag order in the federal case in Washington, D.C. These arguments have not uh, swayed any of these judges. He's his own behavior is the thing that has gotten him into this situation where these gag orders are being applied all over the place. So I would expect that the judge would uh, um, be quite happy to have one in place, you know, tailored in the right way so as not to run afoul of any sort of due process issues or First Amendment issues. But the judges have been able to do those in the other cases, and they have been effective. Suzanne, I've got to ask you about Trump's latest request to delay coming up with the cash in the E. Jean Carroll <laughs> case, right? It's, it's almost 500 million bucks. People are snickering, saying he doesn't have the dough. But that does not mean that a very, very rich person looking to curry a favor with the next potential president wouldn't happily cover that bill. I'm thinking back to all the people who threw parties and events and booked entire floors at Trump hotels and golf courses while he was president because they wanted to be in good standing with him. Right. And you mentioned the E. Jean Carroll case. That's 83.3 million. He also has to come up with hundreds of millions for the attorney general's case. And this is something everybody's watching. I think because of the monitor that's over his business, we are going to know how he comes up with the money. But he he is going to have to either come up with the money or it looks like he's seeking out a bond in order to to do this. But he's going to have to basically come up with pretty much cash, bonds or stocks, something pretty liquid because these bond companies that underwrite these, they want something pretty liquid because it could go against him. And it's a high risk bond that they're going to have to write and they're going to want to liquidate it very quickly. But we're going to see 
I think in short order, it's a matter of weeks, just how he's going to come up with the funds. And, and so far, the courts seem unwilling to cut him a break. He's going to have to come up with either the cash or a bond, pretty much in the full amount, and in the case of a bond, probably a little bit more. So far, Nikki Haley has proved that there is an appetite for a non-Trump candidate. Is that trend going to continue tomorrow? I think so. And I think what we've seen so far is that there is a significant faction of the Republican Party that doesn't want Trump to be their nominee, that wants Trump to go away. It's just that that faction has not been a majority. And we've seen it consistently now in several states. My guess is that we'll, you know, she might do better in Vermont and uh, Maine. She did win in D.C. But D.C. and places like that are not exactly the microcosm of the Republican primary electorate in general. And Trump has consistently shown that he has, if not a large majority, at least a narrow majority of support within the primary voters. And I, I assume we'll see that play out again tomorrow. Larry, should Trump be scared? These numbers might not win Haley the nomination, but could they be enough to rob him of the White House. She said it over the weekend. Donald Trump has been in Michigan for year, basically running there for the last eight years. She showed up a couple of months ago and had a really strong showing. Well, of course it can make the difference. We, we don't know yet. I mean, look, where would those voters go in November? They could go to Trump and maybe half of them will or more than half of them. But since one assumes the Republican Party uh, ID affiliation would take control, but a few at least would go to President Biden. Some would go to the third party candidates. And who knows? Some of them may sit at home. So there are really four options uh, for the uh, Haley voters. Uh, I think Trump should be concerned about it. Of course, he isn't. He assumes that his popularity is such that it would overwhelm any opposition. But uh, that is a problem for him, whether he admits it or not. Mark, Donald Trump is definitively running for president. And it seems like every speech he gives, he is dying to say he got rid of Roe and he is to blame for no deal at the border. I get that he's an unconventional guy and sort of grievance is what he runs on. But is this really how he thinks he can become the next president of the United States? Well, it's how he did it the first time. He said, you know, Lex made all break stuff and he broke stuff. And so, but that's the big question. I think fundamentally uh, what's going to happen tomorrow is that the decks will be cleared. It'll be clear that that Trump and Biden are the nominees of the, of the major parties. Uh, that's unlikely to change. And everybody's going to be exhausted by the notion that we're going to see a rerun that nobody wants to see, which is just remarkable that in the greatest democracy in the world, we're ending up with a couple of candidates that three quarters of the country doesn't want to see. But uh, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, Joe Biden has a good case to make, and, and, and that's good news and bad news. He's got a good story. The bad news is that he's got a good story, and he's not doing well. So how much better can he tell the story than what's already been told? But he's going to have to do a lot better. And listen, he starts off behind. The bad news for Biden and the good news for Trump is that Trump is now ahead by a larger margin in the polls than he ever has been since he started running in 2015. McKay, Democrats are trying to downplay these new polls, but is that really the right move? Or should they be flashing them as a warning sign? If Donald Trump really is a threat to our democracy, should they be driving this home to motivate all those voters who, to Larry's point, could think about sitting on the couch in November? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a delicate balance here, right? The Democrats want to project a certain amount of confidence and strength. They also know that, you know, fear and uh, true alarm at the, the fate of democracy is going to get their voters to turn out. But they can't keep their voters in a suspended state of panic for the next six, seven, eight months. Right. They need to they need to pace themselves. So I imagine that we will see some of those flashing warning signs once we get to the fall. But I think at this point, th the Biden campaign is just trying to show the country that they're not in a kind of a death spiral. Right. The coverage has been so bad. The fixation on his age, on, on his mental you know, abilities. I, I think that they are trying to calm everybody down right now and say, look, we've got a long time to go before the election. Let's not fixate too much on polls at this point. I don't know if it was a tough decision in 2020, but you didn't vote for Donald Trump or Joe Biden. What do you think you're going to do this November? I'm not going to vote for either one of them again. And it wasn't that tough. Uh, I, di I did the same thing in 16 and 20 and will likely do it again. I'm hoping that there will be what another. What does that help? 
Voting for neither one, yeah. who does that help? Who does that serve? Because the likes of Donald Trump or those who want to push voter suppression would love to hear people say, I'm going to write in a candidate. That's essentially yeah. not voting. Yeah, not really. I mean, I think that's why we have the ability to write in. And people deserve to have choices. You? In our state, uh, Joe Biden beat Donald Trump by 33 points. My vote did, was not swaying the final outcome of the Maryland uh, votes, but I did get to make a statement. And, uh, you know, I, I, I voted for, you know, Ronald Reagan saying this is I think that we need to get back to leaders like that in the Republican Party. It would be tough for him to be the next president. Yeah, probably. Um, I wish I wish it were, you know, another way. But no, you're right. I want to ask about the Supreme Court twofold. Uh, your thought on them hearing Donald Trump's claim of immunity, if they do side with him and decide that a U.S. citizen is above the law, that could be transformative for the future of this country. Of course. Well, I, so look, um, I've got a long history on this one. My dad was infamously uh, was the, the deciding vote in the House Judiciary Committee, the first Republican to come out for Nixon's impeachment and said, no man is above the law, not even the president of the United States. So your dad was, wasn't Hulk Hogan? No, it wasn't Hulk. No, that's my <laughs> uncle, Hulk. Hulk. But my dad, uh, but yeah, that, those words are still true today. I mean, no man is above the law, not even the president of the United States. And uh, I don't think the president should have blanket immunity. I don't think that that's the way the court's going to rule. Uh, but, you know, it's certainly an important issue for us to, to continue to pay attention to. Do you want Donald Trump to face a trial? Should there be a verdict before the election? Should the American people go into November knowing the outcome of these charges? I would prefer that. Um, I mean, sometimes the justice system moves pretty slowly, and so I'm not sure if that's going to happen. But I think we need to get to the facts. I know that there are a lot of people that are you know, uh, distrusting all of our institutions and their Republicans that say it's weaponization of the Justice Department. But there are serious issues and problems and things that have to we have to get to the bottom of. And it'd be better to get them uh, resolved and have those court cases decided. I mean, I have confidence in our justice system, and I think we've got to get them. It's it, it would, it's going to create more havoc if it happens after the election rather than before. The Supreme Court decided unanimously that Donald Trump should be allowed to be on the ballot in all 50 states. Yeah. Do you agree with that? I do agree with it, and I, I'm glad it was unanimous uh, because the really, uh, I think the voters are the ones that ought to have that determination in November whether they they want Donald Trump to be president or not, and not have a state just not allow him to compete. It's just not the way our system works. In spite of, you know, uh, all the all of the concerns and questions about Donald Trump, he hasn't been proven. Uh, guilty in a court of law, and you can't just kick somebody off the ballot. The voters have a right to decide. You have said before when it comes to abortion, especially in your state, it is protected. Democrats are making too big a deal of it. In fact, that it's, it's under threat or under attack, but it is going to now be on the ballot in Maryland in November. Has your view changed at all, especially now that we're looking at other states where now IVF is in question, and there are states yeah. that are, are no longer protecting women's rights? Sure. Well, my record has always been very clear. I promise to protect women's rights. I did that as, for eight years as governor. Maryland law is one of the strongest in the country. And it, then why is it back on already, the ballot? It, 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 there really isn't. Uh, so there, the, the law, the, the thing on the ballot just codifies the existing law. So it's not really, we've got to be honest with Maryland voters, it's not really going to change anything. But it protects it. No, it's already protected and it's not going to change anything at the federal level where I said I would vote against the ban. But yeah, IVF, I was the first uh, person in the country to speak out against that ruling. I thought it was absurd and ridiculous. And it's it's such a wonderful opportunity for for uh, families who want to have children that aren't able to. IVF is great. And I, I spoke out long before anyone else in the party did. I do want to ask, you were one of the, maybe not the first Republicans, but you spoke out against Donald Trump pretty early on, which is a difficult thing to do. What has that been like for you as a Republican? Because right now we look at Republicans that are, curr in, are currently in office and we're wondering, why don't they say anything? And we might not appreciate what that's like. What was it like for you? Well, it's certainly tough to stand up anytime uh, when you're uh, among uh, you know, friends or a member of the group and you say, I disagree with all of you, and you come out and you have the courage to stand up. But I think, I think a lot of Republicans actually agreed with the things I was saying. They were just afraid to come out and say them. Uh, but I was rewarded by the voters of my state, Republicans and Democrats, who appreciated the fact that I told it like it was. And uh, sure, you catch some flack and you get called names. And But I think we need more leaders that have the courage to stand up. I'll stand up 
to the current president, the former president, to the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, and I'm going to tell people exactly what I think. And, it, you know, I'm not as concerned. Most people are too concerned about their next reelection and making everybody happy, whereas I just, you know, try to give people exactly what, what I think the right answer is. Was the blowback tougher than you thought? Why don't other people do the same? I'm, a, I'm in a little easier position in the, because there's only about 20 percent of the people in my state are Republicans. So the, in the other places, they were challenged by primaries in a very red state. It's tougher, I think, to speak out uh, without more blowback. Uh, but, yeah, it, it, uh, I think we need more profiles and courage. And I think uh, it's one thing if somebody you know, really strongly supports everything the president says and does and they really believe it. It's different when people know that there's something wrong and they just they won't go out and say it. <laughs>